Hi guys, welcome to yet another episode of Stoic Talks Season 2. Uh, this particular episode is brought in collaboration with DSP Mutual Fund. Now, in this episode, we converse with Ravi Dharmshi, founder and MD of ValueQuest Investment Advisors. Now, Ravi was fortunate to be born and brought up in a family with very deep equity culture. But as we discuss, his venture into equities was anything but planned. Now, it has been 22 plus you know, years of investing experience for him, but his most cherished experience was his early days when he worked with and under the guidance of the late Rakesh Junjunwala. Ravi's investing process has evolved over the years, but his investing style is deeply influenced by Rakesh Ji. In this episode, while we do explore the great Rakesh Junjunwala from the lens of an insider, we do focus and dig deeper on Ravi's investing style and his investment philosophy. So let's tune in. Hey Ravi, how are you? Welcome to Stoic Talks. Uh, great having you here. Uh, Nuresh have introduced me to you in past and I was always wanted to talk to you in on this platform. So good to have you here. Thank you so much, Puneet. And thanks, Nuresh. Uh, it's my pleasure. I, I, earlier, I didn't believe I was worthy of being coming on your platform. Uh, so that's being humble or uh, however you want to put it, but uh, we'll keep chasing you even for the next series. <laughs> Absolutely. No, you you have all access to me. No issues. In fact, I admire the work you guys do and I truly do follow everything that you guys put out there. Great. Yeah. Good to know. So Ravi, let's do one thing. Let's, you know, for the benefit of listeners, we just generally the first question we always ask uh, all our guests usually is to is to give an introduction to how you got started to the markets uh, uh, you know, whether your family was into it and, you know, how do you got introduced to stock market in the first place? And then eventually what have been your journey at least till the start or till the time you become professional money manager that you are today? Sure. Sure. No, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, uh, in hindsight, it looks like it was always meant to be, but that's not how it was when I started out. Uh, so like any other uh, young kid going through school, college, had no idea what he wanted to do in life. I was not one of those uh, super bright kids who had clear vision and focus on uh, what he wanted to do in life. I was not that. I was good. I was an above average uh, uh, in academics. Uh, but I was still keeping my options open. I didn't know what one, what I wanted to do. In fact, this was in the late 90s and all the buzz around that time was the dot-com and internet. So, yeah, even uh, you might not believe, I mean, I have done commerce and then I did uh, law and then I did my uh, MBA in finance. But in between, I had even done, uh, you know, kind of a diploma course from NIIT for tech and I have also done six months of uh, a very, very intensive uh, diploma in advanced computing, which is from a uh, institute called CDAC, uh, which is re responsible for our, uh, you know, the supercomputer that India has, Param. So, uh, I mean, there was an active thought process to get into the technology side of uh, the business world rather than come on the market side. Now, when I was in my college days, I used to, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, go to office my family has always been in uh, equity market so uh, that option was always available to me but uh, i mean i i was more casual uh, i had a very casual attitude towards uh, the markets i mean this option is always available so uh, i used to go to office and was fascinated somewhat with what was happening stock prices going up and down i clearly remember when i was still very young maybe in first year of college or something my uh, brother actually took me along to those are still the days when the ring was there. Uh, uh, in fact, I was not in college. I was in school, uh, school holidays or something. And he took me to the ring. And there is something called as Vanda session that used to happen every 15 days where all the discrepancies in the trade used to get resolved. And I could not make head and tail of what this was. How in this large room can people, you know, shout at each other, make... Uh, sign languages and make trades it did not make any sense to me uh, but it was fascinating nevertheless and uh, uh, even at that point of time one could not uh, help but feel that all oh, around uh, uh, you know the building the environment and you could feel that there is a certain vibe to that particular place so clearly it, it 
I mean, it is eventually it all ended up being part of my subconscious, which led me to take the decision that you know what this is where I need to be. But honestly speaking, the decisive moment came for me when I went to US and uh, I was doing my MBA. I actually got a lot of time, uh, you know, to do a lot of reading. Prior to that, I was a you know uh, a college kid who was just wanted to have a good time in life. Uh, and at that point of time, I got really serious about my uh, education, non-formal uh, education way of getting educated also, like making connections, reading books, understanding how money has been made in the past. I would have read up like 40, 50 investment books over a course of uh, three months. And uh, uh, those were the times which were still the early days of internet, uh, 99, 2000. So... A uh, lot of all this material was, you know, available on the internet. And uh, that was kind of fascinating that you suddenly had access to so many things. So uh, anybody at that stage, I mean, would, I mean, you know, would want to take advantage of free knowledge that was available. So that is, I think, uh, where I decisively became clear that uh, I wanted to get in the market. However, I didn't want to come back to India still at that point of time. I still wanted to uh, probably do a job. I got an internship and... Solomon Smith Barney, uh, which now does not exist as of today, it actually became part of City at one point of time, at a point of time, Travelers Group, and then uh, I guess it got merged. So uh, during that internship, I was very keen to do a job, and my boss was actually quite fond of me, so I was very hopeful that I'll get a job over there. Unfortunately, 9/11 uh, happened uh, during my. Uh, prior to my graduation. So I graduated in May of 2002 and 9-11 was September 2001. And at that point of time, uh, besides the two twin towers that fell, there was one more building that fell. Uh, fell. And uh, that was uh, where the Solomon Smith Barney main office in New York was. And, uh, and after that, there was chaos. Uh, even the Harvard graduates who had gotten an offer were getting their offer rescinded. So uh, I knew it was pretty bad uh, and tough situation uh, and uh, I was like okay even at that point of time it was a temporary thing that I will stay back we get some experience three four years I mean of course I don't know if things would have taken a different turn at that point of time but my bent of mind was to come back to India so then I was like okay you know what if this is tough time right let me just come straight back to India and I think that was the luckiest break that I got because I came back and I joined Rakesh Junjunwala and India had the best bull market of uh, our lives in the last uh, three decades. So that was a learning and earning period like no other. So I can't, uh, you know, thank enough my stars that I actually end ended up being in the right place at the right time. And, and how did that transpire? I mean, how did uh, the first job you landed was with Mr. Junjunwala? So, uh, of course, uh, Rakesh ji was a good friend of my brother and uh, that played a role in that, of course. But but that was also the time, again, as I said, right place, right time. He used to be a one-man army. He did not have anybody besides an accountant and some staff working for him. And at that point of time, he decided to build his team. So, uh, that is, I guess, that is where uh, stars again got lucky for me. Uh, Utpal Bhai was the first one who he got on board. Uh, and of course, there were many other in the process that were going to join. But since I had just come back from US and I really did not have anything else to do, I joined him as well. I very clearly remember when I joined him, it was still his old office in uh, Vithal Das Chambers. Uh, and uh, I mean, it was honestly uh, not an office uh, fit enough for a man of his size and stature. Uh, but that's the way it was. I mean, he was... Uh, he he was very attached to that particular office. Uh, it was very uh, right next door to Bombay Stock Exchange. It worked for him, but then of course because he was he had started building his team, so there was a need to move. So we moved to Nariman Point a uh, few months after I joined, and uh, yeah, then the story began. You know, generally I um, I have noticed with many people that the first job they pick up in equity markets end up becoming the kind of investor they become. Obviously, things evolve, things change. But uh, but the underlying principles comes from the first key job you do in the markets, uh, be it, you know, a chartist or be it a momentum guy or somebody like that. So would you say that your investing style today is a 
pretty much a reflection of how you have learned your ropes from Mr. Junjunwala in the starting days? Or have things changed dramatically different for you? How has that chat journey been post you become an equity market participant? No, no, absolutely. There is a very heavy influence of uh, Rakesh ji in my thinking, thought process, action. Uh, however, I would like to say that a lot of uh, influence has come from my brother as well. Uh, I have used to be uh, working with him during my college days. And a uh, lot of my principles in life I have learned from him. So uh, Rakesh ji has obviously a huge sway over, especially... You know, the ability to decide, the ability to take calls, the ability to deploy large money, that I have learned from uh, Rakesh ji. And uh, I have uh, been a uh, first-hand witness to some of the decisions that he's taken. And it used to, you know, shock me to say the least. Or, uh, I mean, I used to be, how can somebody like that decide? Now, but now, with 20 years of experience behind me, I can understand that, he was not taking quick decisions. He has actually been uh, going over that thought process or he has seen that movie play out again and again in front of him. It's just the sheer accumulation of experience, knowledge uh, that enables you to take those decisions quickly. So obviously he was a very astute mind and he, he was a very quick judge of a person's character, very quick judge of uh, business potential and... Uh, then, uh, I mean, if once he's made up his mind, you cannot change it. Doesn't matter uh, who you are or what you are. Uh, it, it was the most difficult thing on this planet is to change Rakesh Ji's mind about something. So uh, that will just tell you that uh, you you have to be really on top of your game. You have to be very very uh, on ha your numbers have to be on your hand, uh, and you cannot go and bullshit to him honestly. So uh, I have learned a lot from him about all those aspects from my brother, of course, because, I mean, you mentioned my brother is actually known as a technical chartist. That's how he started out. And uh, in his uh, past, he used to actually have those pink large sheets and make uh, almost, uh, almost 150, 200 charts he used to make by hand. Every day he used to plot that... Uh, candlestick or uh, not candlestick i think bar chart is what he used to make so those were the days prior to the advent of the softwares and uh, he used to do that so i was influenced by that as well now the way it has influenced me is not that i use uh, technical analysis in my investing but uh, what charts tell you is uh, the demand and supply in that stock and uh, when key levels get get broken you need to understand that so for example today we are at an all-time high what one needs to understand is that no investor okay doesn't matter what time he has come is losing money at this point of time i mean of course he one could be losing money by uh, investing in a wrong stock but overall as an aggregate in market nobody is losing money because it's at an all-time high level and uh, market cap is at an all-time high level not index so now that human psychology plays a big role and human psychology is what is reflected on the charts. So, uh, and it's not like Rakesh ji uh, saw, looked at the charts and he understood anything, technical analysis or something. In fact, he had a kind of disdain for a technical analyst that, you know, there is no technical analyst who lives uh, south of Cyan. Uh, but, but, but even he knew the importance I mean, uh, his friendship with my brother was clearly because he respected his views in the market. Uh, you need to be able to see as is. Finally, uh, what I would say my brother's strong point is that, you know, he's happy to admit when he is wrong and uh, just take a corrective action. And, you know, a lot of times we actually get stuck in our own biases and know how can... I have bought and I have made a statement publicly that I'm bullish on this. Then how can I go back on my words? I cannot sell this in my trading position. All those kind of things muddle your thinking. So it is great to have a sounding board who can make you see the picture as is rather than what you want it to be. So I think uh, those qualities are what I have learned from uh, my brother. Uh, and again, I don't use technical analysis on a daily basis or anything, but if there are key points, key events, 
key things happening in the market extreme events are being pan, are panning out then one has to uh, take cognizance of that sure sure so uh, let's do one thing i i mean rakesh ji has been favorite investor of entire country right everybody has seen him uh, you have the fortunate you know uh, i am very privileged to have seen him up front close and personal and in action yeah so before we get into you know your style of working how about a couple of you know anecdotes that you remember you mentioned quick decision making you remember you mentioned not able to change his mind something which which you know had a huge influence on you you still remember you sometimes cherish and sometimes when you're sitting and thinking about him probably you enjoy those thoughts any any such thing comes to your mind no there are tons and tons of those but i'll tell you i'll give you two three anecdotes so once uh, this particular company um, should i name it okay let me name it uh, it's been a while now it's been almost 20 years there's a company called educom that was going uh, private i uh, sorry that was going public and uh, they had come to the market uh, i remember gaja capital was one of the investor and they had come along with them and they were going public and rakesh ji they were pitching to rakesh ji to invest uh, in the ipo and the a market cap at which this company was coming out for an ipo was 125 crore and uh, you know i mean 125 crore today does not seem like a big number but at that point of time i mean rakesh ji uh, i remember at the i mean the guts to ask uh, the promoter uh, that do you know how many zeros are there in 125 crores <laughs> have you ever seen an amount like that uh, so i mean so actually he was very clear in his mind that this is not a business model that can sustain itself they were actually selling hardware and all the top line was basically coming from selling of hardware and there was no so much software involved so at that point of time i was too young to understand his rational for uh, you know not going ahead with this particular uh, investment uh, but uh, along the way it became clear though initially that that company went from 125 crore market cap to almost 4 5000 crore market cap in the peak of the bull market so it at that point of time it looked like you know why would you not invest if 125 crore would go to 4 4 5000 crore and i used to constantly ask him these questions and he was like you know you do not focus on the potential focus on the probability so uh, even though that market cap had come through but it was not a sustainable market cap he always knew there was a flaw in the business model so that is one uh, anecdote that i remember then second anecdote that i remember uh, is uh, there is this one private equity investment that it did we we flew down to uh, amdabad to meet this promoter the company is actually going to go uh, public uh, probably in the next 3 4 months is a company called concord biotech and uh, you know uh, from here when we went we had no idea in fact there was nothing there was nothing there was no project plan there was no business plan nothing there was some person who had uh, left tranbaxi was a techno uh, technocrat had good understanding of the uh, fermentation uh, skill that was required it's a fermentation based api company and uh, he he uh literally went there and closed the deal in 15 minutes and all he asked probably the gist of the two basic questions that he asked was how much money do you need to set up the plant and what kind of stake are you willing to dilute that was literally i mean i mean i'm sure a lot of vcs do that uh, based on that but uh, of course and he had done his homework prior he had he had friends in pharma industry who had given him the feedback that you know this particular skill is a rare skill this particular guy has a good combination of that uh, technical skill as well as a commercial mind and one should be backing that so i'm obviously i was in the dark about those things when the uh, meeting was going on so i was astounded at that point of time how can you just give uh, he i think he gave some 15 odd crores for a uh, 30 40% i can't remember exactly because after that there was again lot of back and forth the company got acquired by mylan then rakesh ji bought that company back from mylan and in today's day uh, he still holds about 25 26% kind of stake in that company he has in his family owns 
so uh, that was one anecdote that uh, really sticks out and there are numerous occasions when you know we are all sitting in a meeting uh, and because he was he was in some kind of a medication sometimes he used to doze off during meetings and a lot of people would find it very very rude uh, but uh, what i mean and we used to be also be like what we are in a meeting over here there's this promoter sitting who has a company which is worth 4 5 10 000 crores and he is like sleeping and that used to i mean i used to be very embarrassed about that but uh, he was subconsciously always there we would ask tons of questions but you know they were just ticking boxes he would get up and ask the most pertinent and the most pointed question there would be about uh, that particular company and and once that answer was out the new new okay you know what this is a no go area why are we even wasting our time so that is how sharp his mind was uh, i mean today i can talk about this uh, but uh, honestly speaking a lot of people uh, see he was a man of many layers and uh, you have to slowly slowly get to know him understand that you know for his first reaction is going to be violently no then he is going to open up a little bit and then when you go to him third and fourth times he will give you a far more patient hearing and he'll be willing to change his mind so it was a process of take, uh, taking things to him and it will not uh, you know immediately is not going to just because you come and done some work it's not like he's going to listen to what you have said and uh, change his mind so it it was a process it's not like he was dogmatic about it he had good reasons why he would not change his mind but if you wanted to change his mind it was something which you have to go over and over again and again with him then he would finally change his mind i think those are the three incidences i one more uh, uh, and as an aside i mean a friendly banter i remember i had at one point of time picked up a stake in a company called uh, natco in my personal this was after i uh, left him uh, and uh, i had gone to pitch that particular company to him and uh, you know i mean he he heard me out patiently i went to him twice thrice he heard me out but he did not invest in that company and uh, he had a bet with me that you know uh, i will bet 5000 shares of uh, uh, this thing whatever the worth was of natco at that point of time that if i have bought arobindo and you have bought natco let's see which one does better at that point of time i can say in next uh, two or three years time natco did far better than arobindo at that point of time uh, just a small minor uh, victory for a student over the teacher but uh, anyway that didn't matter because eventually i mean orobindo had lot of issues and he sold out his stake natco also fell into some kind of troubles much much later on of course but those are some uh, anecdotes that uh, reveal the nature of the man he was an open book he would have his trading positions lying right there he would speak to anybody and everybody on a speaker phone doesn't matter if it is the finance minister or Uh, any uh, corporate head on show speaking he will speak to him on the speaker phone only so and he will not hide anything and sometimes it will make you uncomfortable that you know you are being privy to a conversation that you should not be but that's just how he was so how long did you uh, stay there i was with him till the middle of 2007 so 3 4 5 6 4 and a half years roughly and uh, i mean of course i was working directly under utpal bhai so now utpal bhai i mean I, i will be doing a disservice if i don't speak about him but utpal bhai was completely different personality to rakesh ji uh, but again i have learned tremendously under him he is the typical wizard uh, who has uh, you know everything mapped in his mind organized and uh, and he had all the right words to say he he is the one who would convert the uh, you know so to say a very raw thought process into a sophisticated presentation uh, and uh, so sorry with your you had a question uh, uh, you know how my uh, initial experiences shaped my this thing so obviously uh, i have interacted far more with the uh, you know i i don't want to say रोड साइड बट दैट्स हाउ राकेश जी यूज टू कॉल इट यू नो हम लोग तो सड़क छाप है 
हम लोग तो मार्केट में कुछ भी नहीं लेके आए थे और पैसा बनाना सीखा है बट एंड आई हैव इंटरेक्टेड फार लेस विद द सोफिस्टिकेटेड वर्जन ऑफ द इन्वेस्टर्स हु आर ऑल एम बी एज विथ एवरीथिंग सो आई हैव वेरी वेरी गुड मिक्सचर ऑफ बोथ द थिंग्स आई कैन अंडरस्टैंड द ऑन ग्राउंड द पल्स ऑफ द मार्केट एज वेल एज यू नो आई कैन अंडरस्टैंड द लैंग्वेज दैट मोस्ट ऑफ दीज लार्ज फंड एंड एम बी एज एंड दो स्पीक सो दैट आई थिंक those two worlds are very different even though they are very much part of the same market sure and and you know i'm sure a lot of glimpses of uh, rakesh ji is going to come further in all the answers which you're probably going to give but i'll now come to you know your way of doing things and actually my first question usually i you know i start with asking about how do you go about your stock picking but i i want to pick up something from your copy presentation which i was glancing through when i found a Uh, a very common slide nowadays which is you know you start with a universe and then you filter it down and the process is mentioned where you have started with some 400 500 companies and then you based on some quality filter and so on and so forth uh and the first point there is that you filter on the basis of balance sheet quality right uh i just want to ask how this thing has evolved over a period of time because whatever my experience myself plus my interaction with other people has been is that that thing has dramatically it was like a switch in 2007 8 9 market that um, pre 2008 there was very little to do with balance sheets and post 2008 everybody understood the importance of balance sheet was it something similar for you uh, was it uh, or something was different when you were with rakesh ji and utpal ji and uh, maybe they were more balance sheet focused than the whole market was so just just run me through that part of the process no no balance sheet was very much part of our uh, analysis even at that point of time of course the uh, importance and the uh, emphasis that we gave to the balance sheet changed clearly during the 2003 8 period if you were too stuck on a pristine balance sheet uh, you lost out on a lot of investment opportunity but uh, that did not mean that uh, you never looked at the balance sheet uh, clearly we were in a stage where the huge the cycle was in a bullish cycle and it was driven by capex and usually what happens in a capex driven cycle is that these at the bottom of these cycles these balance sheet look broken the businesses look shattered so uh, and we used to always face issues like whenever we want to when to meet the companies they used to be asking like why why are you even invested interested in a company like ours you know that is the kind but they did not have the perspective of the cycle of the industry so uh, at some point uh, you know in a business cycle market cycle you do try to invest in uh, businesses which might not be the triple a uh, never need any kind of leverage uh, absolutely spick and span first of all there are no such companies that's a myth but whatever the uh, uh, scene is uh, you still try to pick the better of the company even within that particular uh, business so balance sheet was always a focus but yes you are right the pendulum really swung the other way post 2008 where uh, people wanted to invest only in quality companies now uh, there is a difference between a great company and a great stock uh, we are i am more in, inclined in buying a great company good company average company provided they will be a great stock i don't want to buy if they are just going to be great company but a bad stock so uh, our focus is not to filter out everything in that qualities that's why we have kept the quality filter right at the uh, upper end of the funnel where uh, what we want to weed out is ugly serious corporate governance issues uh, never generated any kind of wealth industries all those are weeded out at the top of the funnel and we still keep uh, the quality filter as i said we will buy a good or a great company or we might buy a company which market perceives as average but which we believe is not is an above average company so that is where we draw the line in terms of the quality and not at right at the top where only the quality companies uh, come out of it so uh, that and then uh, one more thing that i will draw out which is uh, probably different from what rakesh ji used to draw uh, do is rakesh ji paid a lot of importance to importance to valuation you know he would actually buy like of course we all know that he is bought dhfl 
and in hindsight of course that was a mistake is but aurobindo is associated with other companies so uh, his quality filter was not that stringent but his valuation uh, filter was very very stringent he would buy only and only when the valuations were totally in his favor there was no chance of him losing money if uh, uh, if he was right on the business opportunity so obviously in the, it might so happen that uh, uh, some of the wealth that was generated was not a sustainable wealth uh, because later on those corporate governance issue do come to bite back so one thing uh, i do is i try to keep slightly uh, more qual- uh, stringent quality filter and i keep try to keep a slightly more lenient uh, valuation filter as compared to rakesh now rakesh was again he was at the other extreme of the valuation he will as i said not buy anything unless the valuations were totally in favor so i this is a le- lesson that i have learned over the last uh, 10 15 years is that uh, if you are bullish on a particular sector a thematic you should you don't have to go and buy the cheapest stock in that sector or theme you are Uh, it's okay to pay twenty percent premium to a really good franchisee rather than go and buy the cheapest stock. Uh, over and over, time and again, it has been proven that even the large companies give as much returns, if not more, and probably some of those returns are far more sustainable than the cheaper uh, stocks or the cheap, uh, lower quality companies produce in that particular sector. So. Uh, that is just our filtration process and how it is different from what i learned from uh, rakesh ji stoic talks has been partnered by dsp mutual fund which was an obvious choice for us having interacted with the dsp team earlier and recognizing how they are obsessed with helping investors take better decisions Some examples of their motivation to help investors do better are visible in their research related work which they make available for free including getting smarter tatya report card their invest for good blog among others and many more reports we thank team dsp for supporting this episode of stoic talks and recommend that you follow them on twitter their handle is @dspmf uh just to give a flavor to the listeners also uh is it a largely quantitative uh, criteria or, or is it a list which you have over a period of time developed that okay these are some 400 500 companies we are interested in uh, how has this no, list been it is not a quantitative filter at all in fact the first way we build the universe itself is very very subjective first we choose the sectors or the industries that interest us so for example as of today uh, i'm i mean we not only it reflects in our portfolio also it's not only in our filtration process but uh, i have no interest in uh, maybe metals or uh, agri stocks or all those kind of things uh, we need to have a positive uh, top down thematic view on it if that view is positive then that particular sector gets featured into the uh, universe now within that also uh, we might uh, look at all the companies from that sector might come into the sector but we are interested in only the leader or the challenger or somebody who is doing something differentiated so we are not going to uh, as i mentioned in the past we have done those mistakes but we will not go down the curve and buy the number 7 company because on valuation basis it is the cheapest we would rather buy at number 1 or number 2 company uh, who are doing something uh, differently and uh, it's okay to pay 10 20% premium for that uh, that that is a lesson learnt uh, in the last 10 15 years so I'll, i'll come to the valuation part again but just to just to make it very crystal clear to the listeners also so what you're telling me is that it's a top down sectoral preferences so i am getting a sense that obviously with time that this list is also changeable you absolutely uh, yeah no no i'm sorry i didn't complete my answer uh yeah so uh, the it is a dynamic list uh, we make exceptions like so we you used to have a very stringent crit filter that uh, you know we need at least 10 years of uh, balance sheet or the financial track record before we even look at it but some of the companies that do come to ipo we don't have access to that kind of data or sometimes uh, the company itself doesn't have it i mean a lot of companies which are less than 10 years old 10 year old do get uh, 
listed on the market. So for example, Nika, not like it features in our uh, portfolio, but it does feature in our universe because we do, we understand that this is where the puck is moving. This is where most of the new business models are going to come from. And you would want to be ahead of the curve in understanding the business models. So it is important that you in, include those companies as well in your universe, even though they might not get featured in your portfolio for a long period of time. You start building your understanding about the company. See this process of finally picking the stock. It's not like one particular day an idea came and next day you decided it doesn't happen that way, at least for not for me. Uh, it is a process over a long period of time, you know, kind of you have developed a perception about an industry, you have developed a kind of uh, liking or disliking towards an industry, uh, you have placed a particular in company in a particular uh, manner in that particular industry. So those things keep panning out and then suddenly you see that so now you have a positive top down view on the place, you okay, you're bullish on capital goods, you're bullish on uh railway defense all those kind of teams and then at that point of time you want to know technology wise which company is superior management wise which company is superior who has managed the balance sheet well during the downtime all those kind of things are uh you know uh, are very quick so th that is the ready database available that okay this guy managed his balance sheet well this is a superior management to this and because that is built over a period of time because of our experiences or either because of the actions of the management that we have that database built. And then uh, all you need to do is just put the growth prospects on top of it to understand, okay, is that uh, and growth and valuation perspective on top of it to understand whether it is attractive enough or no. So sometimes what is apparently a very quick decision is because that database was already there and then you just put the outlook and valuation perspective on top of it or some other uh, trigger like, you know, a management change. Like I'll just say it with an example. Uh, we have been tracking a company called Bajaj Electricals for a long period of time. Uh, and we always thought that, you know, what is this management doing? They had EPC company as part of the EPC as part of the company. Then uh, of course there was an unfortunate incident that uh, the promoter's son, uh, Mr. Neeraj Bajaj, he passed away. So, uh, there was, uh, and they were implementing something known as a theory of constraints, essentially where they were converting from a B2B business to a B2C company. Uh, uh, so th there were these things and we were always like, you know, it's still not right time, still not right time to bet on it. Then things changed. The EPC business was farmed out that, you know, a corporate event like that triggers that, okay, you know what, we need to take a look at this company again, because we had clearly mark this company down because EPC was part of the company and the moment that is going out then you need to take a relook at it but then again this unfortunate thing happened so you need to then you need to go and see okay new CEO has come in now you have to go and see what is the new CEO saying is what is his focus what is his priority and when you meet the new CEO it became very clear that okay now you know he's a focused guy he's focused on uh, turning the business around and making the company either number one or number two in each of the categories that they are focused on. And it's a six category company versus some of the other companies which are one or two categories and they are either number one and two already. And he is further looking to build the brand and build on that success. So then it then it becomes very clear that, you know, okay, at 12, 13,000 odd crore market cap uh, and versus a leader who's probably at 70, 75,000 crore market cap, the gap should not be that large. Uh, so you try to uh, build that scenario. What is the probability of this company being a 25, 30,000 odd crore market cap over a three, four, five year horizon? And uh, I think then it becomes very clear because we had that kind of a history with the company where and the reason for not investing at that point of time was clearly identified. And when those things change is when you go and uh, start building your position. So this is where it's interesting because over the years we've seen you with changing evidences. Say, I remember your presentation back in 2020 on how chemicals as a sector had become overvalued to a point. And there was a point of time few years back where you were so gung-ho and you actually killed it across. And even today, many a times you talk about themes. I remember you giving an acronym in uh, COVID in 2020. I just can't remember the name. Maybe if you could... Recall. Consolidation. Essentially, COVID was, uh, uh, you actually had consolidation across sectors. Uh, and it was like what we know as today as K-shaped recovery. 
so the top uh, stronger the balance sheet stronger you became and weaker the balance sheet you got out of pushed out so there was a market share uh, uh, migration happening to the stronger players it was an opportunity more than a crisis uh, which i believe there was a v shaped recovery uh, then it was uh, uh, in, uh, in in india focus or atmanirbhar something of that i forget i and d is of course digitization so all those things kind of got accelerated in covid so we were actually positioned in uh, chemicals pharma it platform companies prior to covid and all these businesses got a huge tailwind because of covid however we realized that you know this it's bunching up of business but it does not look sustainable and uh, market is extrapolating that and you know there was enough evidence on the street you could see that so for example we had one particular company in our portfolio i will not name it but the, it was kind of a quasi growth not quasi but a proxy play on the growth of in fang uh, microsoft and uh, apple and uh, facebook and all that and they had started slowing down already in us and their stocks had started correcting so it was only a matter of time that it will start featuring over here as well in the companies then we had uh, again loras is one company that we had picked up a huge stake uh, it was a big portion of our portfolio uh, and our hypothesis of course got boosted a lot by the fact that covid uh, drugs portfolio become a big portion of uh, loras's number but again now covid went away as soon as it came it was a 4 6 8 quarter phenomena at best and suddenly now we are seeing the numbers dropping dramatically it was very apparent to us at that point of time see market loves the narratives but people don't go behind the narrative to check the evidence if that narrative is right or wrong people and people put uh, too much uh, or rather an emotional decision that if the stock price is going up it's a great company and if the stock price is going down it's a bad company or a bad management both the things are wrong this good management remains good regardless of what the stock price does and a bad man- management remains bad regardless of the uh, what the stock price does sometimes some management do some mistakes like in terms of either guiding or some of them could be actually misleading also or basically building an expectation which are unrealistic uh, so one has to recognize that uh, and you need to look at it from that perspective rather than get emotional about it and say or you know he lied to me or so so and so forth so uh, yeah i mean i would rather be pragmatic about all these things than take emotional calls and one has to change the view when uh, things have played out its course or if market is being uh, is making a mistake by extrapolating something that is unsustainable it is your it is your duty to take advantage of that very interesting way to put it so uh like uh, say currently uh, we keep on seeing this there is a duty to hold rather than duty to change right so but how do you track all these changes because we've uh, seen you've changed your portfolio depending on themes you've been able to actually go gango in 2020 then become a lot more sober seeing change in extrapolation so how are you what is your process of tracking or as a team how do you go about it no so uh, first of all i didn't go gung ho on chemicals in 2020 it, we were bullish on the team, in the bullish on the team since 2014 uh, and as you i mean you have seen my presentation which i made in uh, in, in investing conclave uh, uh, where i made a self presentation on uh, chemicals that, that was in december of 21 so and i listed out my thesis right and basically you do go into the reasons why you bought it and see whether those still still hold through uh, true or no so we were bullish on chemicals because that entire sector was available at 25000 crores because there were uh, 15 companies which were growing at 10 15% with a bottom line growing at 15 20% and roi roc is uh, upwards north of 15 20% now uh, because of the tailwind from china because of the pollution issues those companies started growing at 20 25% and the bottom line started growing at 35 40% but it did not take away from the fact uh, you know while doing our initial research only we were so uh, scared of betting on the chemical sector because it used to be a b2b sector with no knowledge of what price movements are happening at the back 
which way the spreads are going we had no idea where the profits are coming from which particular product that profit is coming from we had no idea so while betting on it also we were very scared but then at seven years down the line after 20x expansion of the whole sector uh, suddenly people have even forgotten the fact that you need to understand what the source of the profits are and if you go deeper you'll realize most of these chemicals have their 30 to 70 percent of their turnover coming from one or two molecules and they are a big beneficiary of price increase and suddenly you can see on the horizon that raw material prices have gone through the roof the uh, spreads have shrunk freight costs have gone through the roof the margins that have expanded from uh, 14 15 percent to 25 percent are not going to sustain so a peak profitability combined with a peak valuation it is quite apparent right that okay from the next three four years perspective even if the larger trend of chemicals is going to sustain this is not a top-down story anymore you there will be a correction in valuation that is for sure so it could be that it happens through a three four years sideways move or it could happen through rarely that happens mostly it happens with a, either a 30 percent fall if the companies are still very good or with a 50 to 70 percent kind of a fall that's what happens so uh, we are witnessing that what is going on in chemicals and uh, that is that is exactly and there was so many other risks that the market was igno ignoring that there are execution challenges uh, the ability to vertically integrate or horizontally integrate is not an easy thing it it takes a lot of time so many companies are coming to the market to literally cash out you know 10 or 12 uh, chemical companies got listed with an absurd valuation so and uh, so that that should actually you know kind of uh, flip your switch that you know uh, if the promoters think that these companies are overvalued or they want to take advantage of the market situation, then you, uh, what, what exactly are you, uh, you, you don't have any kind of great insight to be uh, out uh, guessing them. Yeah. Uh, Ravi, so, I mean, I'm, I'm getting the sense and I'm trying to summarize it, what you just said in terms of your stock selection. So what basically you're doing is uh, every, and it's a regular thing. There is no, you know, there's not a fixed timing based thing that you're looking at and sitting and deciding you can okay, next few years this sector is looking good but by the very nature of continuous research you have positive view on few of the sectors for the next few years and you are looking at the leader or the challenger or some as you rightly said i think uh, a person who is doing something different in that industry because that brings in the growth element or the uh, sustainability element or the balance sheet element uh, being the leader so, so is that a fair summarization of how you're going about uh, looking at your stocks? No, absolutely fair. Absolutely fair. It's uh, uh, only thing I would add is that uh, that uh, this database of, you know, what Ramesh ji says is that you have to connect the dots and it just, all that comes through just having a reading quite a lot and keep building that database in your mind and institutionalize it. Of course, we have a large team of 15 uh, member research team. So, now, uh, instead of only one or two people, a lot of us are doing the same thing, essentially reading all the time and building our database. And then at some point of time, it will click that this sector is looking good or this sec uh, this stock is looking good. But you, you summarized it well. Yeah. So, okay. Now that, you know, it's quite clear how you're going about selecting the stocks. Uh, let, it, let me also ask some questions on the portfolio construction front, right? So... Uh, in your presentation also, the corporate presentation that you have uh, on your site, you have mentioned that you're very, very concentrated, right? You, I think you mentioned 8 to 12, if I'm not wrong, 8 to 12 stocks. Uh, can you give us a flavor of how do you go about it? Because given the fact that you are going sectoral, top down, uh, I'm sensing that you have a lot more options to invest into for next three, four, five years. Uh, how do you go about allocation into those selective stocks and given that you are 8 to 12 i'm guessing your starting position could not be anything less than 5 6% is that fair or i mean how do you go about it just just throw some light on that so uh, i come from a school of uh, thought that if when once you spot an opportunity it absolutely does not make any sense to be betting anything less than 5 6% on it of course we need some amount of diversification which is why it's a portfolio and not a 1 2 3 we are not yet evolved forget not yet evolve we will probably never evolve or graduate to the level of charlie munger that we can hold a three stock portfolio so we need some amount of diversification and and our experience uh, says that 8 to 12 is more than enough diversification you don't do not need any 
more stocks than that that then you are basically if your number 15 uh, bet is going to be a 3% then it is not going to move the needle for the portfolio in either which way so uh, we are very 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 this is one thing which is common for uh, or the one of the thing that is uh, i would say the base of our philosophy which is we have to be concentrated do so much work that you have the conviction to take a 5 to 10 to 15% kind of a bet uh in that particular company of course then it is defined also uh the size of the company plays a role in it we might be very convinced but if it is a very small company then we cannot go and buy a 15 percent of our portfolio we have to still our as a percentage of our portfolio it might still be five percent but that's because this the size of the company is less we might at some point of time increase it when the size of the company grows so our, uh, as you rightly said, our base bet size is actually 10%. Uh, if everything is fitting, uh, uh, you know, growth, outlook, business, management, balance sheet, business cycle, everything is uh, ticking the box and you're very, very bullish on it. And it is also a quality company that uh, can feature across the uh, portfolios. Then we'll go and buy 10% when maybe or in extreme cases might go as high as 15% also at cost. If we are uh, only 8 out of 10 there, you know, kind of 80% convinced, but either I want it to buy 20% cheaper or I'm waiting for one or two triggers to pan out before I build on my conviction, then I might pick up a 4, 5, 6% kind of a stake and scale it up over a period of time. That is how our portfolio construction happens and honestly, uh, it is humanly impossible to be so closely tracking anything more than uh, 30, 40 stocks or 50 stocks at best. Even with 15 member team, uh, our real core uh, area is 50 companies. Uh, so the filtering process from 450 to 500 companies, it comes down to about 150 to 200 companies where, where we are and we have a cursory uh, eye on it. But our real focus is only on those 50 companies where we go really, really in depth and we would ideally like to be ahead of the curve in forming an opinion. Uh, so if you want to have that, that kind of uh, uh, in-depth research, then automatically you will restrict yourself to fewer companies. Otherwise, you know, I mean, you can have a, if you have a 30, 40 stock portfolio, then your uh, universe is actually going to be 150, 200 stocks. And for that, you will need a much larger team. It is not humanly possible. Even with AI coming in, I believe uh, we will still uh, be, maybe some amount of capacity increase can happen, but it cannot be uh, the right amount of uh, portfolio con concentration or diversification is 10, 15 stocks in my opinion. Okay, so when you start with a 10% stock, and I'm, I'm guessing that you're saying 15%, do you also have a sectoral limit in your mind at a cost level okay, I will not go beyond a particular percentage in a particular sector yeah 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 of course we do uh, we will see you want to be a sustainable portfolio and uh, yes you want to take advantage of the fact that you are early to identify a sector whether it is chemicals or defense or railway or whatever it is if you are early to identify a sector you want to take advantage of, of it but at the same time you also need to uh, accustom I mean uh, provide for the fact that you could be wrong. Uh, so 45% is roughly where uh, we keep that limit. But what, again, we do a lot more nuanced sectoral uh, allocation. Let's like say, for example, today we are very bullish on financials. But financials is a very, very broad term. Within that, there is lending, non-lending, and it does not make any sense to club the two together. What difference does, uh, uh, let's say, for example, an exchange will will it make uh, if exchange is a play on the overall financialization selling of financial products in the country while a, a lending a bank is more a play on the loan being given to the retail guy or to the corporate so what is the connection so we actually try to be a diverse i mean not diversify but uh, distinguish between what is a lending exposure and what is the non lending exposure what, how much is the exposure to exports? How much is the exposure, exposure to consumption? So we try to make sure that to a particular thematic, like say consumption or whatever, we do not have too much of an exposure. We don't want to be only and only based on one particular theme. Actually, 
okay so so let's say if you do have such high you know conviction into a particular sector even if it's not high you're saying that there's a limit around 30 45% you said right so 45% brings in and you also said one thing which is if you have early to identify you want to take advantage of the sectoral run uh doesn't that by default bring in a very dramatic risk that when you are wrong and i'm i'm guessing you might have had some experiences where you were probably a bit too early into a sectoral call and if you have a 30% 40% kind of exposure to a sector uh you know just like people in cash has a cash drag you might have a sectoral weight drag to your portfolio returns for a long period of time have you gone through it in past any examples is this a favor is th- how do you mitigate this risk or you don't mitigate this risk at all how do you see how do you see this no so uh, you are absolutely right you do get into uh, these kind of biases however it has not happened to us that we are early to identify because when you identify it is easy to build your position up what is difficult is when that sector peaks is that you are not quick enough to reduce your exposure to it that is where the challenge lies and it has happened to us in the past with pharma uh, 2015 is when it peaked and 15 to 17 was a period where market continued to do well but pharma as a sector did not do well uh, and the challenge lies there i think uh, we we were not uh, the same change that we have identified in chemical sector we could not identify in pharma or we did not pay attention to it the consolidation in the us um, generic market of the buyers was a secular structural uh, you know f- uh, something that worked against the indian manufacturers and of course the opportunity was shrinking from the uh, you know the profit pools that were available to be tapped and there used to be on every launch there used to be 15 20 day one filers and that told you the competitive intensity if one particular drug is going to have 20 people nobody is going to make money on it so uh, that is one particular change that we were late to recognize i won't say we never recognized uh, slightly late to recognize and slightly late to act on it so as i said that these challenges this discipline of this uh, sector is uh, uh, more required when you are you have changed your we while we are building our position i mean i feel there is very little probability that will be wrong because we don't build we are not 45% exposure from day one right you find an opportunity you take a bet on it you see it working then you realize that this is a sector wide thing you go and place one more bet in some other company and that is how you build your sectoral exposure so your probability of being wrong while buying in a sector is long wrong uh, not so much but uh, probability when the sector peaks and you if you don't scale back your uh, exposure down that is a challenge that uh, we have to overcome hi friends i hope you are enjoying this particular episode i just want to take a minute and thanks the sponsors for this episode toy talks was built on a premise of actionable insights and detailed questioning and that usually requires the independence of doing that work when you're looking for somebody to partner with you are not only looking for somebody who will share your ethos but also will promote this independence of asking fearless questions without any hesitations so when we were looking for someone like that obvious first choice for me was a dsp mutual fund i have known their team i have worked with them for a long period of time you know they have this uh, tagline called hashtag #invest for good which i really like because it really associates which in my observation i have seen them living this as the way of their life and which is very visible if you if you follow their work uh, in public they have done some excellent research efforts they've come up with some amazing reports which everybody enjoys reading for example they have this report called netra uh then there is the transcript which talks about the con call transcripts then there is the annual report nectar the navigator and and many such reports which i enjoy reading and is enjoyed by many practitioners in the investment community so we are extremely proud to be working with such a team they completely agree with our vision for stoic talks and i really want to thank them for supporting this particular episode and if you aren't already i would highly recommend you to uh, follow them on twitter with their twitter id is @dspmf so thanks once again and enjoy listening this show i'm also sensing that 
probably there will also be a challenge that when you are slightly early into your positions uh, and parallelly because you're managing so many I and mean, your your core core is around 50 odd companies and you're finding some other opportunities do you also find sometimes a case where you like a company which is already in portfolio but not really doing well because of the waiting period and you have an additional idea which you are even equally gung-ho about and you're thinking about replacing you know that existing not working stock i mean given the fact that it's a constant research activity and you know you have ideas coming in coming up uh, how do you manage that kind of a waiting period because the more i'm talking to you the more i'm sensing that you are very value focused uh, when you buy companies cheap there is always a waiting period and you know it's easy to confuse a value trap with a you know with a with a market not able to recognize the potential kind of a thing how do you differentiate that if in, in your eyes so switch call is switch call remains one of the most difficult decisions that uh, we have to take so we are not very very uh, flippant on our switch calls we do want to build our uh, conviction we do want to be very sure that you know this opportunity is at least 2x of what i am currently holding uh, in what i am holding i might be wrong in the timing but if my basic hypothesis is still right i would still want to continue to hold on to it unless something presents itself which has where i see the potential to be 2x of the return and not just 20% higher or 30% higher However, having said, uh, I mean, I would just like to correct yourself that I don't want to put any kind of a label on myself that I'm a value investor or a growth investor or anything. I'm an opportunistic investor. I'll go where the opportunity lies. Uh, and uh, I don't care whether it's called a growth in or a value by market. It doesn't make any sense to me because the maximum money, my uh, uh, whole philosophy is to make money when the growth change, changes to value. Uh, sorry, value changes to growth. You want to buy when something market is uh, labeling as value actually becomes growth stock. So that is when you want to buy and those quadrant changes is what then suddenly everybody will try chasing it. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, and we, uh, we like to identify clear catalysts or triggers of when what will uh, change, when it will change, and why we should be buying at this point of time. I am never in a hurry. I am, I'll be probably 20% late to buy, but never be two years early to buy. Got it. Yeah, that, that's precisely where it's coming from. Okay, fair enough. Uh, now let me reverse the question on the selling side, right? So you gave an example of chemicals across the board, the valuation started to become uh, unreasonable, so to speak. And and you, I think, had a very significant exposure to chemical at that point in time when you started drilling it down. And you you also mentioned that it's very important to react faster on that side of the uh, pendulum rather than on the, this side of the pendulum. So when you do react to this kind of a situation where a complete sector, which is very high in your high allocation in your portfolio, uh, do you do you have to by default take cash calls in that case? That okay, the sector is becoming too much. I need to move out, but I don't have enough ideas to put money into. Uh, does that kind of thing happens with you? So in our case, uh, usually the maximum I would have generated uh, cash would be in the range of 25-30%. And maximum maximum period that I would have held on to cash because of lack of ideas would have been three months. Now this is last 13 years history I'm saying. It could be different going forward. But it was not a cash call. It was an exit call on chemicals. And it is waiting for an opportunity to identify the next big thing or something sure. like that. So it, it is not a conscious cash call that I am cash call is something that I would categorize that, you know, there is going to be a recession in US. So I need to create cash across the board. We don't take those kind of calls very easily. Those are once in a decade call and we don't want to take that very, very easily. So only when you believe that the business cycle the market cycle, the leverage cycle, everything has peaked out. Profitability cycle has peaked out. And it's time to be away from the market from the next three years point of view is when we would like to take those kind of calls. So to give you a perspective, in last 30 years, there have been three such instances. Hashad Mehta peak at 92, uh, dot-com peak in 2000, 
uh, and global financial just before global financial crisis in 2008 now you if you constantly have that uh, at the back of your mind that oh no there is a recession coming in us this is coming that is coming then invariably you will keep creating cash all the time so we don't want to take that kind of a cash and it's okay if i am a little late to realize that or understand that there is a big crisis happening but once you realize that there is a crisis it's okay to act fast on it so uh, we will be very very conscious when we take that cash call usually it will be about getting out of a company getting out of a sector and waiting to find another opportunity over the last 13 years uh, uh, when has been the time you've made some exceptions uh, from your say something new comes up right for example we may never buy ipo stocks we may never buy this sort of sectors or this sort of companies or some exceptions which you've made over the last 13 years uh and how do you did you go about it? so you know uh, in rakesh ji's office there was one particular quote and he had a rules for investing and number one rule was you have to be optimistic but the last rule which not many people know is that there there are no rules to the game of investing so uh, we make a lot of exceptions all the time but uh, uh, i mean i won't say they are exceptions it's just that so like people get stuck in uh, their uh, philosophy that this is my core competence and i will never look beyond that we don't come from that point of view uh, since our philosophy is that we are opportunistic my uh, philosophy is to understand that opportunity understand that space and build a core competence before anybody else does so uh if i don't understand chemicals i need to understand chemicals before anybody else does if i don't understand defense i don't understand railways i need to understand it before anybody else does so i like to say my core competence is reducing the time between uh understanding of a sector and placing bet on it to the as men, as much po- quickly as possible that is uh, how i would say so that leads me to make a lot of ex- uh, exceptions uh, uh ipo uh, ipos also it's probably overpriced is a very general statement but then uh, there are sometimes some uh, companies that come to the market uh, which are kind of an exception which are kind of a must own companies and uh, they might not be coming at an absolute cheap level but when you put yourself uh, with a 5 10 year perspective you realize that you need to be owning these companies so i'll give you an example of uh, radhakrishnan ji and i mean we are all uh, familiar with rakesh ji and his but not much is known about radhakrishnan ji so radhakrishnan ji bought i think probably 3 or 4% of jubilant foods on the day of its listing and it was an expensive stock to begin with uh, in ipo and it listed at a premium and he bought almost 3 4% of that company so that got me thinking like how can a deeply conscious value conscious investor like uh, radha kishan ji buy a company like jubilant foods which has never been cheap in its life on day one so and then you once you realize that he is coming from the perspective that it's a 100 store company 200 store company there's a long runway they'll have 2000 stores or a 5000 store at some point of time much larger scale it's a franchisee uh, that has done well elsewhere pizza as a category will easily be uh, you know kind of acceptable in the indian populace all those kind of things when you think about it then you see that as compared to the opportunity that lies ahead of you and the quality of the franchise you don't need to worry about one year two year valuation you need to really be thinking long term and you need to be picking up stake in that and uh, so there are times when such exceptional companies come to the market and you need to be uh, buying them even though from a year to year perspective it might not make sense so that is why you should not be overly focused on uh, the current year earnings or the next year earnings in fact uh, punit you said that uh, you know kind of i'm a value oriented investor but if you were to go and check the pe of my portfolio it will probably be north of 40 so i don't think most people would agree with you that uh, we are value oriented uh, investors but it it's wrong to be looking at a p multiple see p is an uh, derived number rather than something that you take as a starting point for doing your investment i think lot of people get caught up in that uh, you have to 
one thing that I learned from Rakesh ji again is that you don't uh, pin down the valuation of a company in the in sheer numbers, as in the PE multiple or something. You look at what the opportunity size is. You look at what scenario this company can possibly create in a five-year, ten-year horizon, and then as compared to that opportunity, where are the valuations today? Then it will be very clear to you that this company will someday be a thirty, forty, fifty thousand crore market cap, and it's available at two thousand crore. Even if it is forty multiple, it does not matter. It, the stock might not do anything for a year. That's your worst case downside. But over a five, ten year horizon, if you can have a company that can be twenty thousand crore market cap, then don't worry about one year performance. I think uh, that's how I think about valuation as well. And there is no one particular way of valuing a company. You have to. Uh, apply all possible uh, ways of uh, valuing it and see which fits the best uh, in those particular circumstances you know uh, in fact my next question was going to be on valuation itself because this this word has come up so often and you know large amount of a large number of our listeners will be on the uh, in the nascent journeys of investing and valuation is one thing which can be made as complicated or as simple as you want it to be uh and and since you have said you know i'm okay to pay 20% above my valuation above the valuation of the company it is such a esoteric number that we you know most of the investors they say ki yaar it's a feel it's not really something which we can put a number to per se um and and the last answer which you gave also gave a lot of detail on that can you pick up any any example historical current anything and just run us through how you quickly think about valuation in your mind uh and also you know in in the very starting you made a statement from rakesh ji which i have noted and probably going to print it is that don't focus on potential focus on probability or some something of that sort right so how do you bring that into this because at one point we are saying look at the potential 10 years down the line it could be a very big company uh and obviously uh, you are going to build it into your valuations which you are going to pay and on other side we are saying well don't pay too much for the potential also <laughs> so how do you how do you bridge that uh, that concept in your mind no clearly it is a potential as well as a probability if something has a potential of being 100x but the probability of that is 10% you don't want to go with that but if something has a potential to be 10x and the probability of let's say 70 80% then that is what you want to go with again i also made one more statement which you should highlight is that if you are wrong you should double your money so that is the kind of probability so see when i say potential so whether jubilant foods will become a 2000 store or a 5000 store company 10 years down the line we have no idea but we know it will be much higher than wherever it is and i am talking again from the day when it the uh, ipo happened from that point of view that call was not that it has to be 2000 stores in the year 2023 or something like that we don't get caught up in those preciseness of the predictions we are uh, the scenario or is so uh, probabilistic that even if only 70 80% of it is achieved you will be still far higher than wherever you are currently so and in, if that is the scenario you will make your money it might not be that you didn't you might not make the best money but you will still make good money on that and those are the cases where probabilities are in your favor so for example uh you asked for an example natco pharma uh when we picked up it was probably quoting at around 1500 odd crore market cap there there was a potential uh that uh, one particular drug copaxon could earn them 1000 crores profit now uh the odds are such that 1500 crore market cap company and you don't want to be betting really on a one particular drug you know that would be very very uh Uh, i don't know one or zero kind of an outcome but if you have that kind of an optionality which the market is not factoring in and then there is some base business where uh, if you are uh, if you even on the base business you could justify that this uh, 1000 1500 crore odd market cap company could be a 4 5000 crore market com- company without that option paying up for that optionality so in your base case you should be able to justify uh, doubler in 3 to 5 years time and then there should be added optionality which can give you that kicker where you can instead of doubling it ends up being 4 5x or 10x 
because those optionalities panned out in your favor. So that is how uh, I think of it in terms of valuation, in terms of probability. And uh, honestly, it's it's an art and you cannot pin it down to a number. Sure, sure. You know, I, we're taking a lot of time, but I'll just quickly uh, ask a couple of questions which I have kept for last actually. One, in the very starting, you we were talking about, you know, your learnings from your brother about technical analysis per se, but more towards demand and supply. Uh, and you have appreciated the importance of demand and supply. How do you bring that element into all the investment framework which you have discussed so far uh, with any examples, if you can? And then I'll go to my last question. No, so clearly overall in the market perspective now today, uh, market are at a new high and it is a very good example that, you know, people feel, uh, see, a lot of people are very loose with words, uh, new high euphoria, uh, 20 multiple expensive. So, and uh, people don't pay attention to the, that, that pulse of the market is missing. You need to be more nuanced about these things. The markets are at a new high. And in fact, there is no euphoria at this point of time. There is, uh, it's not like uh, we are bursting crackers or people are going out and making crazy uh, buying decisions in their own household or, you know, we have been making hand over fist money for almost three, four, five years in a row. And now on top of that, and on the basis of my p in, uh, in the market, I'm going and making some life decisions. All those things are not there. It's not the classic anecdotal evidence of uh, a euphoria or bubble is just not there. So when people say euphoria, I mean, I, or for that matter, when people say panic or blood on the street also, I mean, a 5%, 10% correction is not blood on the street. Uh, so you have to be very cognizant of whether this is a two sigma event or a five sigma event or a six sigma event. So markets job is to oscillate between extremes and in between actually it does not make any sense trying to predict only at extremes. You can be very sure that, you know, this is an extreme and this is an extreme. And those are the points that you want to really say this is an extreme downside. Nothing will happen. You have to put your money to work over here. Or on the other side of the extreme also, it has to be two standard deviation, three standard deviation. And it has been going on for so long that people have forgotten the word risk. Something that happened in the case of chemical sector that people forget and uh, 70, 80 multiples become part of the parlance and par for the course and people start taking it as a granted. That is where you have to say that was this is extreme and it is not going to sustain or COVID times when it was uh, so down, it was falling 1000 points at a time in Nifty. And, uh, uh, you know, there were, there came a point where if Nifty was to fall 1000 points a day for seven more days, it would go to zero. Now, obviously, that kind of a thing is not going to happen. And that is where you need to come and say that, come what may, doesn't matter. I don't know how COVID is going to pan out. Market might close down tomorrow. But this is, this is an extreme scenario. And you need to put your front foot forward and kick by decisions. So uh, uh, you are better off taking call at the, you have to recognize those extreme moments. And that's what I use the technical analysis for that. This is an extreme. It's not going to go any further than it. It's a matter of days that market will bottom or it's a matter of weeks. That's all the difference is going to be. And uh, I, honestly, even if you had called the bottom of the market at 9,000 Nifty and after that it fell to 7,000, Three months down the line, six months down the line, it didn't matter, right? Because or because the market went way, way more ahead of that. So you have to, it's okay if you don't get the exact bottom. It's okay if you don't get the exact top. But you need to be aware that these are extreme on the down and this is an extreme on the top and you need to be out of the game. That's all, in or out of the game, whatever it is. So do you think this uh, period of, uh, say, uh, from your brother, to see in 2008 helped you to be publicly bullish in 2020. See, uh, all of us were bullish, but how many people actually went on TV? And, so I remember you were more on TV telling this is bullish. There is this is this. I think 2020 was the time when you were. So do you think 2008 also was a factor in that understanding the pessimism as well as. Absolutely. I think I have lived through 2008 firsthand. Uh, 
and uh, honestly you i mean at that point of time i was not a public fund manager so i used to do a lot of trading on my own and i have uh, not many people know but i was short on the market uh, and uh, i have learned a lot from of course from a distance from radha kishan ji and uh, and i very clearly remember once uh, you know when do you actually sell it is like uh, in technical analysis it is when a market makes a peak it corrects 20 30% it rallies again to test the peak or just falls off uh, reaching the peak and then it falls again you still don't go short on the market but the first low that market made gets broken and that is when you know that the game is over i mean and then nothing will come if, if you were uh, you know it's foolish to be trying to time the market from a by identifying the top but once the top is in place it is pretty clear and pretty evident and the game markets will collapse under its own weight because so many people have bought those same stocks at uh, leverage and uh, they are all in losses so the, in the first round people come to try and support the uh, market or the stock or whatever it is the market rallies they are in the money but once that particular level is broken is that that their new incremental bet is also under loss and that is when you know that uh, this is not going to sustain so now this is not a uh, that the trader mentality i don't uh, use it on a daily basis in my uh, portfolio or investing style but this is something that makes me alert at a point that if i am bullish on the market and such something like this has happened i will question myself and i will really go down and ask whether uh, my hypothesis is right or no and if i am not then i need to change my mind uh, one has to be cognizant of that fact so uh, you have i don't profess trading on charts i mean i know nuresh does that or whatever a lot of people do that it's great they can do it uh, i would say charts tell you what is happening they don't tell you why it is happening and i want to go that one extra mile and understand what is happening and why it is happening if you can understand that then you are on top of the game and you will be ahead of 99% of the crowd absolutely that is why there is a saying in technical analysis don't ask the why you are not capable enough to answer it <laughs> yeah but i mean i i am a i don't like to call myself a technical analyst so i want to go behind that why and that is the reason you go beyond it the whole point is see the re- uh, i was asking this in 2008 so we've seen uh, once you've seen a terrible cycle that is where you get the next cycle right uh, in terms of bottom right you can't expect ke you come into the markets 3 years out you'll be able to get all the cycles right yeah, yeah. no no in fact lot of people say that see i came into the market in 2002 uh, late 2002 early 2003 and after that 5 years bull market so i am a product of uh, the bull market lot of people think uh, that is a negative because eventually you will not get the uh, you you might not be able to recognize uh, when the market turn or you are inherently always optimistic and bullish but i have lived through the entire 2008 being short on the market so i know exactly how it is it even markets job is to move from extreme to extreme so don't be very logical about market has to bottom out here market don't bottom out where it is very rarely fairly valued it is always extremely overvalued and it will go to the extremely overvalued so if uh, the swing on the upside was way more than it should have been then the swing on the downside will also be way more than it should be so you have to wait it out and, and wait for that last bull also to give up and there will be absolute blood on the street yours as well that is when you will get you will get a good amount of time to build your portfolio there is no hurry to catch the absolute bottom sure sure so uh, ravi one last question from my side and then i will let you go because we taken a lot of your time uh, you know uh, can you run me through a couple of your large mistakes which you classify yourself in in your large mistakes library that you have done and which have probably changed or had a lasting impact on your investment framework any any uh cases or any particular anecdote you can remember which you classify as your biggest mistakes see uh there are lots of mistakes i have made in my life first of all let me admit that uh but it is usually only the errors of commission that gets featured in your portfolio but it is usually the errors of omission that pinch you the most 
so i would say hands down the single biggest largest mistake i have made in my life is selling out bajaj finance too early and i'm sure a lot of people can identify with that it will be their largest mistake as well and it is precisely because i went with those headline numbers of four and a half five times book is very expensive and i have the mon- uh, you know four five x my money in a span of 6 12 months you one needs to be careful You're trying to understand not trying to understand the size of the opportunity not trying to understand what exactly this company's dna is and how special this company is and hanging on to what you have bought i mean uh, that is i think i would consider as the biggest mistake of my life having said that i have done enough number of mistakes on the other side as well where i have bought things that i should not have bought uh, but fortunately over there uh, one thing always sticks with me the rakesh ji said make mistakes that are affordable and fortunately all of those mistakes on the buying side have been affordable mistakes and not unaffordable mistakes i would like to continue with that the way we have changed our philosophy is that we will only bet uh, on those turnarounds where the turnaround can be can come through the cash flows of the company not by selling off assets the cash flows of the company should turn it around and second of all uh, that uh, intent and the turnaround should be on the horizon and i don't want more than one turnaround in my portfolio i will never bet i will never have a portfolio of turnaround i mean borrowing from uh, nuresh's uh, terminology of chor bane more i will have only one potential more in my portfolio i will not have a portfolio of more very helpful answer uh, ravi and um... really insightful talk at least for me uh, i'm sure nuresh also enjoyed and i'm sure listeners will also enjoy uh, thanks for giving us your time it was wonderful talking to you a pleasure was all mine i really loved the way uh, you guys are conducting this and it really uncovers uh, a lot of aspects uh, of investing and personal journey which usually don't get covered in the regular formats 15 20 30 minute format this needs a very very long conversation and i think uh, you've done full justice to that thanks a lot for giving us uh, that much time and being candid and that is what we all need uh, your candidness actually gives learnings to everyone so your 20 years comes back to people in 2 hours so that is the motive thanks a lot thank thank you thank you so much guys thank you ravi thank you bye mutual fund investments are subject to market risks read all scheme related documents carefully